In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Professor Jason Box about his recent research that identifies the amount of Greenland's ice sheet that is committed to melting in the coming decades. This so-called zombie ice is not included in the mainstream models, and when added to other sources, such as glaciers and even the sleeping giant Antarctica, then sea level rises will far exceed current forecasts. You can find out more on Jason's dedicated Faster Than Forecast YouTube channel that I have linked to in the text. From next week, I will be reporting from COP27 in Egypt. It is widely assumed that the conference can deliver nothing in the way of meaningful change in global emissions. Many are shunning the conference and it is easy to see why. It is worth stating that for billions of people in the global south, the COP is the only forum they have to make a case for climate justice and seek help as they try to adapt to the catastrophic impacts they are facing today because of our continued, sustained burning of coal, oil and gas. On the flip side, many global south communities are pushing forward with adaptation strategies and becoming as resilient as possible. As climate chaos spreads, we will need their expertise in order to respond to the climate extremes that are now arriving in the global north. Thanks for listening. Please support on Patreon, subscribe on all channels, including podcasts and YouTube. Hi, Jason. It's great to see you again and ask you some questions about zombie ice. We're talking about the changing state of Greenland ice sheet and how much of the ice will melt and drive up sea levels. Can you start by giving us an explanation of what you actually mean by zombie ice? Right. A journalist gave that name and asked me if I thought it was okay. And I said, yeah, it's not bad. I would say one foot in the grave, but it's technically referring to a fraction of the ice that is committed to being lost. It's going to take some time. It's started already, but we were able to quantify that using what we can observe and what we know already. So it's radically different from conventional ice sheet modeling. In terms of when you say you've been able to quantify it, what is it telling us? What sort of quantity are you telling us? It tells us that if climate stayed stable at the last 20-year average, uh, the ice would lose at least 3% of the area. And that translates to a certain volume. And as you know, there's no real prospect that climate would stay constant for the next foreseeable future. And we even got into scaling, okay, how does the ice commitment to being lost increase uh, as a function of temperature? So we got some numbers on that as well. That's not in the study, but it's uh, forthcoming. So the loss commitment grows. And by end of century, we estimate it depends on the scenario, high emission or like Paris climate scenario. I think we'll end up somewhere in between those two targets that the the ice loss commitment by that point would more than double. And so the amount is uh, 27 centimeters already committed. That's a lower bound, this 27 centimeters. And there can be and there will probably be more than that. Uh, so we really actually just put a lower limit on on the loss. It, it, it takes time. And uh, but again, by end of century, we're talking, you know, just from Greenland, at least uh, 50 centimeters of sea rise. That's huge. Uh, in, the, yeah. in the most likely, yeah. And and you got to think about other sources of land ice contribution because uh, small glaciers and ice caps around the world, think about not just the Alps, but Patagonia, um, Alaska has a huge contribution. So does Arctic Canada. And they add up to almost as much as Greenland in a, in a low melt year. Uh, so, and then there's Antarctica, the the sleeping giant, which already shows signs that it's waking up. And, you know, so by mid-century, end of century, we're, we're probably going to be facing much bigger numbers. Okay. I want to come back to that. I'm really interested in how this work that you're doing tallies with other widely referenced climate model outputs on sea level rise. Yeah, they don't compare. They're in a different ballpark completely and so if you just put our number which has no timeline uh, we argue that it's the majority of of our uh, committed loss would be delivered by end of century Um, but if you put them on the same graphic our numbers are a factor of two larger than the high emission ipcc 
uh, ice sheet model projection by end of century. And ours assumes uh, that number is equivalent with a steady climate of the last two decades. So they're completely at odds with each other. However, we know that there are numerous physical processes that ice sheet models don't yet capture. And so it's it's not all that surprising that, yeah. that uh, conventional ice sheet models aren't delivering as much ice as we think is possible and, and that we observe you know, you you see with your own eyes processes that you know are not in the models that are very sensitive ways that that ice uh, is melting. Okay, and I, I just want to highlight that you talk about this in your video, which I'm linking to in in the notes from this, is that you've got these other processes that are not being picked up by. I'll call them mainstream models because they're they're much more out there. Are you able to close the gap between what the conventional climate models are telling us on sea level rise and the work that you're doing? Because it sounds like we're kind of sailing blind into a very risky situation. Yeah, our numbers do two things. One is that it provides constraint to existing conventional mainstream models, a very different um, activity. Uh, so a lower limit, uh, that's the kind of constraint. And it also delivers the message that people that are concerned about sea level rise uh, need to prepare for more than are mentioned in the IPCC documents. With the asterisk that IPCC, uh, the latest sixth assessment report, does have a, a red line, a kind of an asterisk, because they have the, the, the main model projections, but then uh, an independent so-called expert elicitation that, that has the possibility of much, much larger sea level rise. And that much larger sea level potential is given one out of 20 odds. And a lead scientist on that said, if you've got one in 20 chance when you're crossing a road of getting hit by a car, are you going to wait for the traffic light? Are you going to cross that road? Of course not. And that highlights um, our failed approach to the risk management. So even though there are low probability, high impact events, risk remains high. And in a national defense kind of context, in a risk management context, it's it's like why we have uh, fire insurance for our house, low probability, high impact, and, and we have some coverage and we need the same kind of coverage with the potential high impact climate events that are in the cards. You can't uh, say exactly when it's going to happen, but there's a there's quite a likelihood that this one in 20 thing that this could happen this century. And that's in many of our life. Time. And what could make that more likely are other feedbacks that are not well represented in global climate models. For example, uh, additional release of methane from uh, thawing permafrost, um, the types of tipping elements in the climate system if the Amazon, it, Congo, tropical forest, um, which are already shifting from sink of carbon to source of carbon, if those get in runaway, which we've seen some of evidence of that already, then those those additional carbon sources will amplify the projected climate warming. And so they seem, I would say, more than likely to be present in the future, those types of compounding factors because they're they're not in the all of the climate models. They don't the the carbon budget isn't tightly closed in global Earth system models. It's very complicated. So it's not from lack of brilliance on scientists' part. It, it's a really tricky uh, complex. There's all of these interacting elements um, that are hard to verify in the field and etc. So the there there's a tyranny of averaging that you get from climate models. Uh, what people's eyes go to is the, the median of the curve and there it goes. But there are there's an envelope that can be extremely large um, that tries to encompass these low probability, high risk scenarios. And we know that the global climate models don't produce a, a climate system that has the fidelity that we observe. They're like a facsimile of reality. And they don't really reproduce the infinite fidelity of, of nature. So sure. when you talk about all of these various factors and the, the fact that you have these kind of tipping elements and so on, and then you go back to your analogy of the, the one in 20 chance of crossing the road, it, it seems that the more you look into it, you see that the traffic's getting heavier and the cars are accelerating. And then you're still still asking yourself, am I going to cross that road? And, and ultimately, we don't have any choice but to cross the road because we keep 
missing our earlier choices in many respects. Right. It's become a cliche that the projections tend to underestimate. Well, ice melt is, is, a, is a great example. And it's because of, again, a number of known factors that are not included, plus some other unknowns. So the projections of sea level rise have been steadily going higher by including more sensitivities that we observe in the field. I mean, looking at your work, one of the reasons I was so kind of alarmed really is because I think many of us tend to think of sea level rise as um, from ice sheets as a bit of a slow burner. And when you combine Greenland melt with all these other ones that you've mentioned, do you think we we need to really start assessing coastal cities around the world that will either need large scale boosting of defences or even you know abandonment in some cases? I think that message has already gotten through coastal planners, those responsible for coastal infrastructure and and planning. They understand that this risk is there. It's colossally expensive to mitigate. And some resourceful areas have begun installing pumps and planning for this. Um, It is a bit of a slow burn, I would say, as compared to the loss of water security and therefore food security. So that's more immediate. It's, It's now. It's driving increasing migration. The sea rise issue will be forcing itself on the agenda increasingly. Already is doing that in places like Florida, which don't have the ability to build seawalls because of the porous ground. So they're already spending hundreds of millions on pumping systems. And in areas where you have a concentration of wealth, it it will be possible to mitigate sea rise, which raises the disproportionate impacts on poor countries, areas sure. which simply cannot afford the very expensive infrastructure changes, and those coastline areas will be forfeit. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, well, look, I, I really just wanted to get this update from you, but really to emphasize that people can follow your work on the um, Faster Than Forecast YouTube channel. It's great to see you again. Thank you very much for giving us a brief overview of the Zombie Ice Project, if you want to call it that. Yeah, it's good to talk. Have an ice day. 